Has God given you a goal and a dream that is so big that only he can fulfill? Well, Fit Sister, today is the day to listen to an episode and be encouraged in your heart. Over 30 years ago, Pastor Matthew Barnett was given a dream that only God could fulfill. And today, Tim and I are, are there, actually, serving in the place of his dream and vision at the LA Dream Center. And did you know from that one dream center, over 100 other dream centers around the country have been established, helping those who are addicted, those who have been abused, those who have lost their way, those who have served our country and have suffered homelessness, and many more stories. It is one of the most compassionate places on this earth. And people from all over the United States and other places come to the LA Dream Center. So as you listen to this episode that was recorded a year ago, when we were at the Dream Center with our awesome New Hope Church and Pastor Phil Sadica of New Hope, we were able to take a missions team as Tim and I have been serving there since 2018. I cannot wait for you to listen to Pastor Matthew's heart. This has been one of my favorite episodes of the Warrior Up podcast. In that room, when Tim recorded us, the Holy Spirit filled that room that we were all in tears. There was so much joy just in the blessing of getting to serve and having the heart of God to serve others, to get out of our way and to get fit so we can serve the kingdom of God and build it in Jesus' name. I cannot wait for you to listen to, the, to today's episode. And if you would, please pray for Tim and me as we are at the LA Dream Center this week, as you're listening, please pray over the Dream Center and over everything that God has, the best that he has for every person involved. And please pray that he uses us to the fullest capacity in Jesus' name. And I pray that you are blessed by this episode. God has so much more for you in store. Wake your heart up. Big things are coming for you and to serve the kingdom. Let's get fit on purpose. I can't wait for you to listen. Here we go. Welcome to the Warrior Up Podcast. You guys, today is a dream day for me. You are in for an epic episode that God has ordained. Pastor Matthew Barnett has become a friend to me and my husband, Tim. And he is a hero of compassion. He is a champion of the faith. He is a warrior for God. He is an incredible author. He is a sought-after speaker. Um, he has this ministry in Los Angeles that you just have to experience for yourself. It is this ministry that reaches out to those who Jesus says, you know, that don't forget those who are lost, who are broken, who are in prison, who are addicted, who other people would look down upon. Pastor Matthew has this vision to reach out to those who other people wouldn't take time for. He is also a man who has ran seven marathons in seven days on seven continents to raise money for the Dream Center. And I'm just beyond elated to introduce him to you. Pastor Matthew, thank you from my heart for being on the podcast today. Yeah, it's a great joy to be with you. Thank you so much. Well, I am excited to see what how God's going to lead this conversation today. Yeah. So can you tell us about the Dream Center, how it got started and... Yeah. Yes. I, I always say the Dream Center feels like it's like in the natural. It feels like the, the biggest mistake ever because mm -hmm. I, I came at 20 years of age and my dad, um, you know, was given a building in the inner city of L.A. Uh, by a denomination that said, we're going to sell this to the banks if somebody doesn't come over and take over the church. And so my dad in Arizona, a very successful pastor, the guys came to him and said, Pastor, can you find a way to salvage this church in the middle of one of the most, well, the most at that time, gang-infested areas in the whole country? And uh, my dad said yes, because he didn't like the thought of them losing it to the banks, but he had no idea that a church like this could be born in downtown L.A. Um, and, and he just said, yes, I'll figure something out. And that's how it really started. It wasn't like an intentional meeting, church planning thing. It was just one of those things. And so my dad couldn't find a pastor. He was driving around the neighborhood. It's like, would you help me plant this church? And then they saw the neighborhood, the gang members sitting on the, door, on the steps of the church. They're like, no way, I'm out of here. And so my dad couldn't find a real pastor. So he asked me to take over the church at 20 years of age. 
it's 29 years later, we're still looking for the real pastor. You know, it's just like, but, but he turned it to me at 20 and I went through a lot of heartbreaks. You know, I was just so consumed about what I thought success would be and, and everything fell apart except for all I had left was a desk and a phone and I put on the sidewalk and just started giving away five bags of food that I would buy at the grocery store outside that little church building and blessing moms in the community and family members who were walking by, playing soccer with the kids, and and then eventually it turned into one house that we had in the community that was given to us that I started taking people who had drug problems and addictions. They were living in my house with me. I had no wow. idea what to do. And then it turned into several houses in the community that we just started to take one by one, had a little recovery program in the in the neighborhood. And so... Um, and then one day I'm just driving down the Hollywood freeway, praying for a new building and God gives, shows us this big old hospital, 400,000 square feet. Every horror film was filmed here for like 10 years. It was empty. Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, all that was filmed here. And, um, and so the Catholic church was going to sell it to Paramount for $16 million in 94. And instead they said, um, we'll sell it to you guys. Um, after we told them what our vision was to, to be the dream center, which is now today a 24 hour building that's seven days a week. Hundreds of people live here every single day who are coming off of drugs, alcohol, families that are homeless, emancipated minors, Mm -hmm. veterans that are homeless, all of them that live in this big old hospital. That's an iconic building on the Hollywood freeway underneath the Hollywood sign that's open for whoever will. And it's interesting because everything that I thought, um, I was going to build had to hit rock bottom. You know, the church, I thought, well, I'm going to attract people to come in. And, um, and I just, I think sometimes we undervalue the power of rock bottom because great dreams wow. are born in rock bottom. Yeah. When you have nothing left uh, and then nothing to lose, you're a dangerous person for God at that point. Mm-hmm. And so we just started saying, let's just build a 24 hour church that will never sleep and be open. And now hundreds of people living here every single day, 30,000 people a week being fed through all the programs. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's, it's, it's a miracle. And I think one of the reasons why, is that um, sometimes you have to let your dream die so you can find God's dream for your life. And that's really mm-hmm. what being it takes shape. And now 29 years later, we're here on this campus. And I know you have uh, served here so consistently. You've come by and trained the women in recovery program and, and just poured into people. And, and I know Tim has spoken um, at the event with all the guys in the recovery program and made them laugh and cry and all, this, mm-hmm. all the good things. But, you know, it's in 29 years, you go through a lot. You see a community change. You see heartbreak, heartache. And, um, but you know, we've just kind of lived every single day believing that there was a miracle around every corner. If we just keep showing up. Okay. So what comes to me this morning, I was even thinking about miracles upon miracles, the small things that have added up to, I mean, we are in this hospital now, this church that never sleeps. Yeah. It started with a small miracle. It did. Yeah. And how God is not. Okay. So tell me, I want to know, how you've kept going though, is it because of the little miracles or I, I mean, cause your vision was so big, Yeah. you know, how did you, how did you maneuver through it? I guess even cause there has to be a lot of challenges too. Cause whenever you're fighting the darkness, you're going to have a lot of opposition, but you have such a spirit of an overcomer how, and I know that you have champion parents and you have the legendary Tommy Barnett as your father, yeah. but you know, how, um, how have you had that spirit of like, you're so positive in Christ, but you've had so much hardship too. Yeah. You know, that's a really good question. Cause when we, when we bought this building, um, we turned on the water, the pipes busted everything. And like three times my dad and I have taken every money we've had, every cent we've had just to try to keep the place going. I mean, it's been one of those wild things. And you know, when, one thing my dad taught me that changed my life. He said, if you have a vision for the finish line when you start, you'll never get discouraged by slow seasons mm. as long as you're just committed to the end, you know, and, wow. and, um, and you have a heartbeat that says, I'm here to do a great work. We're here going to build the walls of the city. It might take some time, but we're going to stay in the fight. And what's happened as a result of that is I learned to celebrate little victories on the way to the big things, mm. because sometimes That's I think good. in life that when we go through hard times mm. for the rest of our life, we kind of punish ourselves for the bad things that we have done. And we make a big deal about the past, but we don't really celebrate the little things that we've done well over time. 
And, um, and wow. so my dad used to always tell me, you know, you need to make, and that's why sometimes, you know, if somebody like blesses the dream center and like in a staff meeting, I'll give like a check to somebody say, look what someone did for us or what well, pastor, pastor Jensen Franklin recently really did something generous for us. And so I handed it over to, uh, to people and then, you know, if they don't make a big deal about it and rejoice, I get mad at them. I'm like, you will not short circuit the process of, um, of going where God wants you to go without celebrating. You've got to celebrate every day along the journey or else you're, you're going to get so consumed mm. by what the vision looks like that you'll never be the person that can fulfill the vision by having that joy along the way that it takes um, to make it to the finish line. So I just decided to make a big deal about a lot of little victories. We do that in the recovery program. A guy comes up to me, says, Pastor, I've been clean for 15 days. I just like lose it. I'm like, are you kidding me? That's the greatest miracle. Mm-hmm. 15 days? Mm-hmm. So I think we need to make, make a big deal about progress along the way yeah. rather than um, kind of overhype all of our deficiencies and weaknesses as well. So perspective is everything. I'm looking at your book right now because I've read all of your books, but your newest book, One Small Step. Uh, so Tim and I are out here on a missions trip. So we started coming in 2018. Amazing. We met through Pastor Chuck Balsamo, which was such a God thing. <laughs> Love Pastor Chuck. And I know he's spoken at your church many times. Um, but I started reading your book uh, in 2020. I guess it was during COVID, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I started reading it again. I, I brought it with me um, on the airplane. And again, I'm in tears. You guys have to get his books. Uh, okay. you. I'll, I'll put um, in the show notes, I'll give you some contact info. But the one small step, it's about following the nudges of the Holy Spirit and um, taking a step of faith. So, okay. So yesterday, Tim and I, um, we were out with our team. So this is our first time of bringing our church family with us. And we actually have two of our children with us, too. So it's been so amazing. But we were out at MacArthur Park. Oh. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, and so it was it was one of those things that you guys, like our, our, our oldest son said, you know, I always thought of L.A. Hollywood. Mm-hmm. But he said, I never thought of it as smelling, you know, like urine every mm-hmm. step that you take and seeing so much poverty. He says, it, it appears here that you're either in poverty or you're really rich. Exactly. So there's no middle class here. Yeah. Um, so taking one small step, I, I would love for you to share some people or um, from your program or, you know, that you've helped through the years that really stand out where you've taken that one small step. And they, their lives have been changed because of the Dream Center and because of your, your ministry and your heart to take that nudge. Because i got to tell you this, Pastor Matthew and Pastor Caroline, they're people that they walk the talk. I mean, we have known people where, you know, they're, they're great, they're, they're kind, but Pastor Matthew goes above and beyond to show you that you matter and that you're seen. I, the first time that we came here, I remember there was a man... He was on the parking lot and he was looking for his girlfriend or his wife that she was lost. And we had the privilege of meeting you and having a tour of the Dream Center. I remember that you spoke with this man and he was dirty. Um, You could tell, obviously, he was homeless, probably struggled with addiction. You took that time and you had so much compassion to love on him. And you were texting someone to find out ways that you could help him find who he was looking for. Mm-hmm. that is the kind of person that you are. And I believe that that servanthood, like we get to serve, that mindset, that perspective changes the whole church. If we could just go out with that. But uh, I'm going to let you get no. let, answer that question of, you know, like um, the way that you take small steps. I would love to hear, you know, a story or two of people where you've been able to do that and changed a life. Yeah. And I think it, it gets harder as a leader, as the organization grows, because it gets bigger and bigger and you have a lot of people in place who could do those types of things. So you have to really fight to like find time to put yourself into the depths of the humanity's pain, mm-hmm. like show up in those places because you're not really the sharpest as a leader when you're you know, creating great ideas or big days or anything like that. It's just when your heart is broken. So you have to kind of fight to keep your heart broken and you have to put yourself in situations like that. And, um, because every single time you do that, you, you see people's lives change. Like Barry, this guy was living under the homeless, uh, under the bridge here for 18 years, just right down the street here. And, um, 18 years living under the same bridge, he became so famous for a guy that people could not remove from a bridge. I mean, he literally, that was his life. And so we tried everything and reach him. And 
One girl in a youth group, a teenage girl, said, I heard that guy's living homeless. I'm going to bring him to the Dream Center. And in the back of our mind, we're all like, yeah, right. Good luck with that. <laughs> like a girl from Oklahoma here, 24 hours, finding that guy. We've been working on him for 18 years. Good luck with that. But we didn't say that. We just said, praise the Lord. God bless you. Go for it. You know? <laughs> but in our mind, we're like, we had a lot of doubts. But, um, but she went under the bridge and said, sir, you need to come to the Dream Center to get food. And he said, no. She like, grabbed him by the hand and him. walked him to the Dream Center <laughs> And he's standing in line, 18 years living under the bridge. I mean, mm -hmm. so much pain. And mm -hmm. he just kept getting food every day, just every day getting free food. He kept, kept showing up. And then, um, but he didn't stay for a Bible study. He didn't want anyone praying for him. He didn't want anyone talking to him. He'd get his free food and he would just leave. And uh, one day I'm like, God, this guy is using us. He doesn't even want to help, get help. He just wants free stuff. And then, and then God spoke to me a word that changed my life. He said, if you want to be a bridge of hope to the world, you got to allow yourself to be walked on. If you want to be a bridge, oh, oh let this man use you for all the free stuff. And then Come sure on, enough, right. <laughs> a year later, he checked into the discipleship program. He graduated. And now Barry, he's still there. He's do, uh, working with all the guys who are just kicking off that of drugs in the room. Amazing. And, you know, so... Wow. The longer you get here, the more you realize people can change. Mm, I mean, mm -hmm. we label people. I think the government like, many times will, will, you know, mental health. Yes, there are legitimate cases of mental health, but there are some people that have just been on drugs for so long that if they had like a year of being sober and encouraging people into their life and yeah. people to minister not only to their need but to their potential, they could do great things. And so we're finding a lot of people, like when they get to their right mind, they're like sharp, they're powerful, they're dynamic. And mm -hmm. uh, so... That's the great thing about the Dream Center. You know, the program's a year long. Gives people a chance to work through many layers of their life, get their head clear for the first three months, start the process of developing new habits, and uh, just believe that it's possible. Um, the other day, we had police officers drop off a guy in chains, you know, and he's like, hey, man, I don't want to put this guy in jail. Would you guys take him in? We're like, sure, you know, take him in. And uh, so it's just kind of like the gift of inconvenience and just having that mm -hmm. mindset that, that man's need is God's call for the day. Wow. And so what is your God's, I think we're always big about what's God's call for our life, but um, God's call for today is whatever's around you that you can help and serve and make a difference. And so we've tried to keep that mindset over 29 years, try to avoid becoming like so corporate where you lose that personal touch of relating to people because we're not corporate, we're the body of Christ. And so always mm -hmm. stay childlike and yet grow and be smart, be better in everything that you do, but never lose that childlike heart. Pastor Matthew, that's so good. That's so good. I my heart is so touched. I just Tim and I have been crying since we've been here. I mean, <laughs> um, yesterday we were able to talk with uh, Eric. We were able to talk with Gabriel. We were able to talk with CJ. And um, I love the fact you know their names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I I see them in my heart, and um, we were able to cry with them, and they were crying. And it's like, you know, they're no different than us. No. They need someone to believe in them and not look down on them. And you could see, like, Gabriel, he had his... There's like a, a covering of shame that the enemy puts on people. And whenever you look into their eyes, even whenever they're, they're struggling to look at you because they, they're just overcome with shame, but they, they have this glimmer of hope because they see it in you. Pastor Matthew, you guys do this every single day. You guys have to be a part of this ministry. Please go to the ladreamcenter.org or ladreamcenter.org. I'll put it in the show notes, but you guys, this is one ministry that if God is touching your heart, please support them in any way. I know that prayer is important, but they need finances to care for all these people. They need the money. Uh, but okay, so you just made me think of the story when you and your dad went to Skid Row. Oh, yeah. Well, can you share that? I love this story. You know, it, it was a 15th year anniversary of the ministry, and I went through a year where I just felt like weary and tired, and like I couldn't feel anything. And I know we don't go by feelings, we go by faith, but... It was way too long of not feeling anything. And so the church was going to do this big old party, 15th year anniversary and of the pastor. And I said, you know what? Forget about that. I just want to go and live on the streets of Skid Row and see what God wants to say to me. And so I was walking out the door and the guy in the recovery program went with me. And I said, I'm just going to stay homeless for like 72 hours and just know what it feels like. And so my dad was in the room. He's like, where are you going, son? I go, I'm going to go live homeless in Skid Row. He goes, you know what? I've always wanted to see what that was like and feel that. He goes, I'm going with you. It's like, it's like me weeks to build up to this. That my dad's like, amazing. yeah, let's just go. <laughs> and so we're living under the bridge. We're like panhandling for money. Um, we're seeing things on Skid Row that are beyond what 
we think television is kind of overhyping Skid Row. It's not. It's underhyping. It really is for what's going on. I see, you know, young ladies or prostitutes jumping from tent to tent and wow. all these horrible prostitution mm. things going on. And just every d- horrible thing under the, the sun was going on. I didn't think I was going to make it through the night. And, I, and God just spoke mm. to me, just said, hold up your Bible and just walk around. Mm. And it was the weirdest thing. Three o'clock in the morning, people were yelling out, hey, guy with the Bible, do you think God still loves me? Wow. Like screaming wow. through, like echoing off the buildings of downtown. And the only thing I guess that made me qualified to be a minister is they just said, you're holding a Bible. And so I was going in there talking to people in their tents and ministering to them and just finding out how they got there. And how like five miles away is their family, but they can never go back because of what they've done and just all this unbelievable stuff. And that was the moment where we found homeless families that were living under there. And so I called the Dream Center and said, look, can we just get one room for this homeless family? I know years down the road we want to help homeless families and get a program going, but can we just do it right now? And behind my back, and Kelly and everybody said, you know what, we just need to open up a bunch of rooms. I came back, and there's a whole floor. And I said, well, we just need one room. They said, Pastor, we know you, that once you start talking to homeless families, we're just going to, this is going to be what we're going to do. So we just decided to prepare more rooms for it. And um, that was the mm-hmm. night where the homeless family floor was launched and like w- women and children um, were taken off the streets of Skid Row and see the reaction. They're jumping up on beds is it just never gets old wow. to see what happens when they're changed. And so, you know, if you go, sometimes when you go into the valley of pain, there's great vision there. You see things in the valley that you can never see on the mountaintop. That's right. And um, yeah. like I go to conferences. I love them. I get inspiration. I get encouragement. But all the vision I need is just walking the streets in the valley of, of the city and seeing the pain. Wow. Can you share some of the programs that you have at the Dream Center? Yeah, yeah. We have, uh, of course, the Men's and Women's Recovery Program. It's one year. Um, and then we have a second year program for those who graduate who want to save money and move on and build their lives. And so they can, uh, it's not as hardcore as the first year, which is like beans and rice and Jesus Christ, man. It's like <laughs> really intense. And the second year gives them wings to fly. They have curfews, accountability, things like that. And so it's a two year process for some people to recover because they have nothing. They have no IDs when they come in. Many of them just have just no starting point. So uh, that's a great program. We also, of course, have a place for homeless families. We have 38 families. They're living here every single day, a one-year program. Everything's based on that concept. We call it the luxury of time. That's where people change. Um, and then we have other programs, uh, homeless veterans for men and f- male and female veterans. Um, we have a program for emancipated minors who age out of foster care system but have nowhere to go. And, um, and then a shelter for people who just want to get off the streets for a night who aren't ready to make a commitment. So one year. Um, so all these things kind of operate in this building and, um, of course, a human trafficking emergency shelter for the police that work with us to find the girls that bring them here. And all this kind of evolves over time. You know, 29 years, you take on one ministry, and then you kind of get, and then God, I always think that God always puts, the, the needs show up in your doorstep. It's like, you don't even have to be a great visionary. All you have to do is keep your eyes open because mm-hmm. the need will find you. And then you just yeah. realize there's a trend going on here. Maybe God's trying to speak to us about, you know, helping serve and meet this need. Well, one of your quotes is, find a need and fill it, find a hurt and heal it. Yes. And and I love how you guys, your motto too is that, and you, you can um, sum it up for me, but uh, we believed in you before you even came, or God believed in you, or you're accepted. How, how do you say that? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, absolutely. You belong before you belong. believe. Okay. There you go. You yeah. belong. Okay, thank you for I can't believe that. that came to my mind. Remember that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, wait a minute. I know that's so good. I should have written it down. Yeah, because religion that, but... says you believe, then we'll let you belong. But there, the kingdom of God you. has yeah. always been like, come and follow me. Like the fishers and men, Jesus along the seashore is like, you know, there's there's not, nothing that, that these guys were even qualified for. But he said, just let that net and follow me. And um, he allowed them to belong. And then he taught them on the pathway, show them great miracles. And I feel like that's kind of the, the mindset of the church is um, what really God wants it to be is that, you know, don't get freaked out when when people from the world do weird stuff. You know what I mean? Just like embrace the chaos, embrace the fact that sometimes a guy will be drunk in church and you got to like, you know, deal with, I mean, maybe we're just built a little bit different that way, but whatever measure you have that in your church, just open your heart to, to the need because, um, it's, that's what the new Testament church is really all about. Well, I feel like sometimes in the church, we can look at the what instead of getting to the why. I think if we Mm -hmm. can get to the why of, okay, so there was this man yesterday, his name was Jason. We need to pray for Jason. Um, 
it broke our hearts because, it, well, we didn't understand until maybe two or three minutes in the conversation that, okay, his reality is not real. Yeah. But yes, he obviously is addicted to drugs, but he shared too many stories about his grandfather molesting him and right, yeah. too many stories that were real to him. Now he has the, okay, so he shared with us that his grandfather is no longer here, but he said that he punches him. He says, look at my face. I don't, mm. he's my, I don't have teeth anymore. He said, my face swells up. He named other people that were coming against him and tormenting him. And I said, Jesus, wow. do you call out Jesus? And he said, I can't get to Jesus. He actually men mentioned Amy Temple McPherson wow. as one of the people in his head. And he said, she's trying to help me get to Jesus, but my grandfather won't let me because he keeps molesting me. And I'm like, I mean, we're just, you know, overcome by so much sorrow for this man. Wow, because, what a story. Um, you know, you, well, here's the problem is that we look at people and we judge them like they made bad decisions and they deserve for some reason to be there instead of looking at maybe they went through so much trauma in their past that no one was there to help them out of that pit and they chose that drug to heal what they f thought would, you know, overcome that pain. And maybe if we got down on their level and prayed for them and cried with them and sat with them, maybe we would get to the why and we would get over ourselves and actually be the church. And that's what you guys do. Yeah. I want to thank you from my heart for what you guys do. Because you look at those who, and I, we had a meeting time at the very end um, with our groups and, you know, there's a part of me that says, this guy's too far gone. Yeah. yeah. But the truth is, is that not in Christ. No. Nope. Jesus is able. And I thought of the man who Jesus took a boat to get on that island, and he was entrapped with demons and chains. But Jesus set him free, and he's able to do it for Jason. So you guys, pr please pray for him and those who are homeless. Please pray for Pastor Matthew, too. But... Um, you well, know, we just never come here and we're not changed. Is that is that how I want to say it? I mean, we're always changed when we come here. Yeah. And it's, you know, yeah. it's amazing. when you tell that story, it's incredible because you said, you know, too many stories I've heard, too many stories he heard. Uh, that, that's a powerful thing because that trauma lives in people's lives. But, like, who else is really going to talk to people like that unless it's the church? Nobody's going out of their way mm -hmm. to talk to people like that. No one. And so sometimes you'll talk to someone like that and they'll say nice things to you, and then they'll cuss you out in the same sentence. I'm like, consider that a compliment. This is the first time the person's oh. ever got a chance to talk to anybody, yeah. and they're going to relay their struggles, their pain. It's like, it's, it's like maybe you're the first person that could ever even um, you know, be there for them. And so I just thought about that the other day, is, and, you know, when you guys were out there in MacArthur Park, I'm like, who else is going to talk to people like that? Nobody does. You know, nobody does unless maybe they get paid to, like, you know, talk to someone out there. But but nobody's just from the, the goodness of their own heart doing that unless God's people step up. And so, yeah. you know, I just, you, you know, you, you find people at that level. But, you know, trauma, there, there's healing that takes place. You know, there's um, consistency. And one of these days, that seat in that park, I'm telling you, we'll see him check into the recovery program. It happens mm -hmm. all the time. And I, I and I look at people, I'm like, ooh, this is a tough one. Like yesterday, a guy came in and... Um, they, they, they checked him in. He looked really deceived, like, like really disoriented. And, uh, he was walking around and, um, I said, Hey, did you just get here? He said, Yeah, I flew in. I go, Oh, you flew in the program? He said, Yeah. I said, Congratulations. He goes, What do you mean? I go, Cause there's a lot of people fly in and they don't make the commitment. They'll mm -hmm. end up on the streets of, before they even get into the program. That happens all the time. You know, they couldn't take a 20 minute drive or, you know, there and I go, You've already won a great battle. Now the rest just enjoy it. And so, you know, just people looking for someone who's pulling for them. That's why I always love about you and, and Tim. You just pull for people all the time. You're like, you feel like when you talk to broken people, you're talking to the greatest people on earth. And that's really what Jesus would do. He went out of his way and then all of his advisors and disciples were like, we need you to be this conquering, amazing Messiah. Here's your campaign trip. This is where you need to go. These are the stops that will elevate your career as this great messiah that we want you to be and jesus was like no i think i'll go out of the way talk to the woman by the well no i think i'll go over here hang out with the guy who was hiding up in a tree to see me in the parades like he is i mean like and then i think i'll go have dinner with simon the leper right before i'm getting ready to die on the cross so that's what i love about jesus he was just he was need he'd stop everything to respond to a need 
And uh, I think if we just become so intentional and look around for ways to serve and, and opportunities to be to make a difference, it's just it's so powerful what little things can do. People are so unloved. People are so like taken advantage of in this world today. They feel like everything's in exchange. We just do something kind for someone, expecting nothing in return, kind of blows their mind, and they, they almost don't know how to take it. But um, it's those angel unaware moments that are really special that we can be as as God's people. Well, Pastor Matthew, this conversation has been, there are so many highlights, right, to be with the people, but what an honor, what a privilege, what a blessing to be with you today, and for my listeners to be able to meet you and get to know your ministry. Um, I just can't thank you enough, and please thank Pastor Caroline, too, because we just love you guys so much and love being a part of your ministry. And we just believe greater things are coming and that God is going to use us in greater capacities here because we just... When we're here, we're home. We're, we're home. We had our friends last night, um, their first time being here. They've heard about this place when, since 2018. Um, our friend Tom and Jenny, um, my, be- my best friend, they're in tears the whole time because they're saying they're supposed to be here, you know. Um, and so we love you. We just appreciate you more than you know. And you guys, please be sure to check out Pastor Matthew's ministry. Go to YouTube and Google some of his messages. Listen to the seven marathons in seven days. (laughs) That is one of the most inspiring because it will help you in life to learn how to not give up in the middle and how, and it's just a, it's an awesome story and get his books too. His latest is one small step. Um, but Pastor Matthew, before we go, would you mind to pray us out? I would be honored to. Lord, we just thank you today for all these amazing listeners that are just going through the journey of life and just making themselves better by being around people to encourage them and being around the word and truth. And I just ask you, Lord, to do something that only you can do of what they need. The Bible says you will perfect those things which concerneth us. Mm-hmm. And even as they're listening today, I pray that you would reach down deep into the one area that they just can't make happen on their own. They need you to do. And I just pray specifically for that to happen and specifically for that miracle. And then one day they'll remember they listen to a podcast and someone prayed for something very specific that you perfect the one concern that they have tried on their own and failed, but you did what you do. And that is you make up the difference. And we just thank you for what you're about to do in people's lives and bless them in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, thank you so much. And you you guys can't wait to be with you next week. God bless you guys. Have a great week. 